This is what six more months of my life looks like. See these, these grey hairs? That's this lot. This is what I've been up to. Since building the open source response time tool, the V1 I have here, I've learned so, so much. This is a great tool and there's absolutely nothing wrong with using it, but as with all things, especially first generation devices, there are definitely some parts that can be improved. This design is roughly based on the excellent video from Aperture Girl that I'll link in the cards above. If you haven't watched that already, please go check it out, it's fantastic. I'm using the same sensor, a Malexus MLX75305, which is a light to voltage sensor that essentially connects to an Adafruit Itsy Bitsy M4 board, which is using the same 7051 chip that Eric used in his setup albeit I'm using the physically smaller units in the smaller board, but it's still the same thing. There are a few constraints in using that sensor though, with the first being that to get the maximum light level input, you need to power it with five volts. That's okay, the USB bus has that just fine, but the microcontroller's analog to digital converter, or ADC, can only handle 3.3 volts. So we need to chop off that signal using a potentiometer. The problem is that you can think of the ADC as having a, a window that's say this big. The sensor itself has a much bigger output window and the potentiometer's job is to shrink that sensor's window down to the right size to match the analog to digital converter. But now you have to guess where is the sensor hitting its maximum outputs and where the potentiometer is just sort of going off the page. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a pain. I mostly solved that problem in this unit, but the one thing I can't solve is the brightness limit itself. For this sensor, how I have it set up anyway, the absolute maximum is around about 160 nits, give or take about 20. The contrast can also mess with that, but on most displays it takes around 160 nits to max this out. And that's a problem. Sure, for most displays you should be able to either dim it down or brighten it up to that level, but what if you want to test at max brightness? What if you want to test an outright bright display? Plus, the actual photodiode in there is absolutely tiny, meaning you have to run it at 160 nits to get clean data. Anything lower is just full of noise. It also means the darker transitions are pretty noisy too, so it's not absolutely ideal. The solution? Replace the tiny sensor with not one, not two, not three, not four, but five much larger photodiodes instead. Okay, let me step back for a second and explain the difference between a, a light to voltage sensor and a photodiode, because it's kind of important. The latter is actually a pretty simple thing. It's just a piece of silicon that when exposed to light generates current, just like a, a mini solar panel. That's it, it's nice and simple. The light to voltage sensor on the other hand is actually an entire sensor. It not only has a photodiode in the middle, but it has two operational amplifiers, a diode and a transistor built into it too. But why does it need all that stuff? The short answer is that the photodiodes output current, not voltage, and current isn't all that easy to measure, especially when you can be talking about like nano or pico amps, that's one with 11 zeros in front of it. That's how little we're talking there. So an op amp or an operational amplifier, or specifically in this case a trans impedance amplifier circuit, converts that amount of current into a voltage that our analog to digital converter can read in and measure. Basically, the op amp has two inputs, an inverting input and a non-inverting input. Plus and minus here, basically. The op amp wants to keep those two inputs balanced. So if you were to put one volt on the plus side, it really would like you to put one volt on the minus side as well. That behavior is really 
important here and is why I have the photodiodes connected across both of those inputs with the plus side also connected to ground. The important piece here is the feedback from the output which is what makes this whole thing work. On that, that sort of loop back, what you'll find is two components. One is a capacitor, which stops it from oscillating or switching too quickly, which can be a bit of a problem. And the other is a resistor. This is what determines the gain of our little amplifier here. Let's imagine that you're shining a light on the photodiode, which is managing to eke out one microamp of current. That creates a, a tiny voltage across those inputs, and the op amp doesn't like that. So it outputs a voltage, which then feeds back through the resistor to its inputs, allowing the resistor to discharge the current. The size of the resistor determines what voltage the op amp needs to output to balance those inputs. So let's say we're using a one mega ohm resistor here. Well, Ohm's law says V equals IR, so current times resistance, or in our case, one uh, microamp, or one times 10 to the minus six, times one mega ohm, or one times 10 to the power of six, gives us one, so one volt. Make that a 100K resistor, and now it's 0.1 volts. A 10 mega ohm resistor, now it's 10 volts. That might help explain this, um, well, this madness here. These eight resistors make up a total of 1.17 mega ohms, but thanks to this painfully, and I mean painfully tiny chip, they can be individually selected in any one of 256 configurations. That means that this board can be fine tuned for how much gain you want the op amp to have which is actually kind of fantastic and means that I can have this board comfortably sit or measure a 60 nit display all the way up to at least hypothetically extracting my test data to something like 10,000 nits. Admittedly, that is is sort of extrapolated and I've only extrapolated about two and a half thousand, but even at two and a half thousand nits, that only needs a 29 kilo ohm resistor and the minimum I can have here is 800 ohms. So, um, yet. Yeah, it's perfectly capable for sure. Unfortunately, the actual photodiodes, which are Osram BPW34S photodiodes, uh, as best as I can tell, these are likely to cap out somewhere around 1500 nits. So I guess that's the practical limit for this board instead. I went with these as these have both a, a large photosensitive area, much larger than the Malexus MLX75305, and they're also incredibly linear, which is great for a good sort of response data. And also, I'm fairly certain they're uh, very similar to what you'll find in Nvi NVIDIA's LDAT tool. And actually, since uh, we're here and I've never seen anyone on the internet open this, let me show you what's inside LDAT. They're using an Atmel 80 Mega 32A4U microcontroller to read the output from their AD8542 dual op amp, and if not exactly the same photodiode, it's pretty similar. I tested a lot with uh, various configurations, with actually up to 10 photodiodes, to find out where the sweet spot was for the amount of noise versus the amount of uh, sort of data, the, the sensitivity you can get. Uh, and I found out that five was pretty much the best balance. It generally is, uh, the, you know, adding six, seven, eight doesn't give you that much more in terms of lower noise, but it ends up adding cost and complexity and a just larger surface area. So five is, is generally the best bet. There is one other quirk with the op amp. These are what are called rail-to-rail op amps because in theory their output can swing from whatever you supply as the ground or negative power input all the way to the positive power input that you supply. So if you power the board with 3.3 volts, in theory you should get 0 volts at the bottom and 3.3 at the top. Unfortunately, practically, this one outputs around 6 millivolts at the low end and about 3.2 volts at the top end. This is fine, but it makes setting up the board for the, the right brightness a bit of a pain. 
See, when the analog to digital converter in the Adafruit board hits its maximum, it's a perfectly flat line with no noise. In the mode I run, that ca caps at 65,520 when you supply 3.3 volts or slightly higher. But if you only supply 3.2 volts, then it sits just below that cap, and it's still got all the standard noise in it, which means that you can't tell whether that is a correct number or whether it is actually clipping over the top. So to solve that problem, well, you could just power the op amp with the USB 5 volt rail. That could work, but I don't know, dumping 5 volts into a 3.3 volt microcontroller is, let's just not recommend it. So uh, to solve that problem, I'm using a 3.6 volt LDO, which stands for linear dropout or low dropout, depending on who you ask. But all you really need to know is that it takes the higher 5 volt voltage and drops it to a beautifully, beautifully smooth and clean 3.6 volts to power the op amp. That means that the op amp can now max out the analog to digital converter, but still within a decently safe margin. And to top it all off, I've also added a tiny little 128 by 64 pixel OLED. Because why not? Actually, it's because it's really useful for understanding what's going on during the test and with the, the device itself. And also just like how cute the OSRTT logo looks on there, man. Oh, it's so cute. Um, uh, also, uh, right, I do want to make a standard version of this that doesn't have the little display on it, uh, which should be a good way to lower the cost slightly. Although, I'll let you in on a little secret as well. Um, I'm planning on making a much more focused design for input lag with a headphone jack uh, for audio triggering. If you fancy, and likely a single photodiode for a f and a fixed resistance, both to cut costs and to make it a bit more effective with various displays, and also more dedicated software. But all of that one is a little bit of a ways off. I'm a one-man band doing all of this, and I now have two different hardware devices that I need to produce, test, and, you know, actually get out to the world, so um, bear with me. As for this one, I'm still in the final stages of testing and tweaking this to get it properly, well, get it right and get it ready to actually launch and uh, make available to buy as a, a pre-built kit on osrtt.com. Like I said, if you want to be notified uh, when these are available, you can head over to osrtt.com and leave your email in the uh, sort of newsletter box at the bottom of the page. Uh, and like I said, I'll, I'll give you a ping. Um, as always, uh, I, I, you will not hear from me in, until this is available, so don't worry there. You can also just keep an eye on the site or keep an eye on uh, my Twitter, at TetsMGB. There's loads of options, so feel free. This is a massive step forward in being a, a much more capable device, uh, especially now that you can test in pretty much any brightness level you like. That's the biggest sort of hurdle with the, the standard unit. It can be a bit finicky to, to work with various monitors, and it's also because of that brightness limitation, and it's a hardware limitation, uh, there are certain you know devices you might not be able to test, or you might need to sort of point it at a light to get it to trigger to then you know make it work or whatever. Um, I've also had a lot of interest from a, a wide variety of people that I, I didn't even consider would want to test response times. There was a company who, wa who uh, wanted to try one to uh, test their like projectors to test uh, for their like full-scale professional driving simulators, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but the the standard version likely isn't suitable for that because of that brightness limitation. Whereas I'm hoping anyway that the pro version should be a a lot better for that. So I guess we'll see. Um, yeah, like I said, if you want to stay up to date on the, the project, obviously I'll keep posting more videos uh, on the channel, so feel free to keep an eye on the, that subscribe button. Uh, also, like I said, you can check out rsrtt.com. They might even be available by the time you watch the video. We'll see. Um, and yeah, also just to reassure anyone who has the standard model, like I said, it still works perfectly fine. Uh, I've still been using it for all of my reviews and uh, any bugs that you find or anything like that, I will be happy to, to fix. It will continue to be supported and 
work just fine. Uh, obviously I will be focusing my attentions on making this one work, but they're functional. They're functionally the same thing, just with a, a slightly different uh, sensor configuration. So practically they pretty much do the same thing. So it's not difficult for me to support both. That was part of the development as I was trying to use different boards uh, with you know, dual cores and stuff like that, which in theory is great, but in practice, it turns out that keeping things simple and using the same microcontroller makes it a hell of a lot easier. So yeah, um, I want to give a massive thank you to everyone who's uh, obviously bought one of these units and also just been uh, sort of sticking along with the project. It's been a lot of fun. It's been amazing to, to learn a load of stuff uh, about you know, monitors about the, the testing, about uh, relearning electronics from uh, A-level and, you know, going further with that as well. And yeah, it's been incredible hearing from the, the various people who have been interested. Like I said, uh, I've had a, a wide variety of interest, not just from monitor reviewers, but from people all over in different industries that are interested. So I'm really excited to have this in as many hands as possible. And hopefully the pro version will be even better and even more interesting for you. So yeah. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, if you want to check out more videos on RSRTT, there's a full playlist that I'll leave on the end cards. Uh, there's also the GitHub repo, because this is all open source, so feel free to check that out. Uh, and the docs page, if you want to learn more about the methodologies. And uh, yeah, otherwise, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.